Beetlejuice. Ah, the red supergiant star has been in the news recently because of its strange behavior. This star is in relative terms not too far from us, visible in the Orion constellation. It is absolutely gargantuan, and ever since I saw a size comparison between Betelgeuse and our own sun as a kid, I have always been fascinated by it. Now, it is my humble opinion that Star Trek these days misses the opportunity to use real science to help fascinate and educate us about the awesome nature of the cosmos, so I shall attempt to do this myself a little bit. Let's walk through how the Enterprise would study Betelgeuse at the end of its lifetime, and we will get to just why this star has been in the media so much, and in what ways it's relevant to us today. Let's assume for now that in about 250 years, the Betelgeuse has not yet exploded, or gone supernova, as stars of this size tend to do. Our own sun cannot do this. It will not end its life with a cataclysmic collapse under its own weight. The supernova event only occurs about twice a century in galaxies comparable to our own. So this event, even in 250 years, or about the time of Star Trek, would certainly be something we would want to study and witness up close. To prepare for this mission, the Enterprise would take on specialist personnel, like stellar astrophysicists such as Lieutenant Michael Keaton, as well as special equipment such as probes to study the phenomenon. From Earth, the position of Betelgeuse within the Orion constellation is here. Its actual position, from a three-dimensional perspective, is here. Now, according to NASA, Betelgeuse is about 650 light years from Earth, but even with warp drive, using the 23rd century warp factor scale, that's pretty far. This particular enterprise, the Refit Constitution class, as a heavy cruiser is designed for this kind of journey and could nominally travel at warp 7 for long periods of time and warp 8 if necessary without significant degradation to the warp engine components. At warp 7, which is in the original series, 343 times the speed of light, it would take 1.8 years to reach Betelgeuse. At warp 8, it would take a year and a quarter. A journey such as this might be a leg of the Enterprise's second five-year mission. Now, of course, you're all wondering, how dangerous is a supernova like this one to life on nearby planets? I mean, any life that ever existed in the Betelgeuse system would long be extinguished. Planets in the habitable zone would have been swallowed up by the star's first expansion millions of years ago. With a supernova, the most dangerous aspect is the gamma radiation. On a planet with life, the ozone layer of the atmosphere can keep out most of this radiation for a time. But Earth-like planets within 50 light years of the supernova will be bombarded more intensely, and very close biomes may suffer a total loss of their ozone layer, leaving the planet to be scorched by gamma radiation and even more deadly UV rays from its own sun. Obviously, any sentient life that is warp-capable could be assisted by the Federation, but any other interference, even rescue or preservation, may violate some of the ideals of the Prime Directive. That's something for you guys to discuss amongst yourselves in the comments. In either case, Starfleet would certainly want to study the impact of the supernova on nearby life-bearing planets. Now, space friends, do not worry. Earth is way outside the kill zone, despite all the AI-generated clickbait you see on YouTube, Doomsday will not rain down upon us. However, there will be an impact, but before we come to that, let's go over what the Enterprise would do when it arrives. On the scene, Betelgeuse would be surrounded by a massive cloud of gas from the various coronal mass ejections. Unlike our own sun, Betelgeuse is a variable star and highly unstable. Sun flares are par for the course. The first thing the Enterprise would need to do is confirm if Betelgeuse is in the final stages of nuclear fusion. You see, your typical star, like our Sun, is a nuclear fusion reaction. At its core, the inward pressures fuse hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe. Depending on the star type, eventually this hydrogen fuel supply runs out at the core. The star shrinks a bit, and then starts fusing helium at the core. This is when the star becomes a giant, in the case of Betelgeuse, a red supergiant, and expands vastly. There is still a lot of hydrogen in the outer layer, but mostly helium is involved in the nuclear fusion process that keeps the star alive. And then when all the helium is used up in the core, carbon is the next element to be fused. 
At this stage, the star only has about 600 to perhaps some thousands of years left. And for those of you who have already rushed to the comments to tell me that Beetlejuice has already exploded, but the light from the event hasn't reached us yet, yes, I'm aware of that, and you well may be right, I'm getting to that. Now with each transition to a new phase, there is a dimming of the star as it releases the heated gases in an active, massive stellar flatulence. After the carbon stage, you get the last stages which are neon, oxygen, and finally silicon. At this point, the star has only a matter of years left. Spock would use the ship's sensors in an attempt to gather information on the core of the star. If he finds that it has entered the oxygen or silicon phase of fusion, only days remain. The Enterprise would deploy probes at various points and distances all around the star. This way, when the explosion occurs, each part of it can be observed with greater accuracy. Soon, Spock will detect that the silicon phase of fusion has expired, until finally iron is all that remains at the core. But iron is an extremely stable element, and the energy output from iron fusion is less than the energy required to maintain it. The star cannot support its expansive volume any longer and begins to collapse under its own weight. After the star implodes, all the remaining stellar material bounces off the star's core and explodes in a fiery shower of radiation. Superheated gases and materials of all kinds expand outwards. In fact, in this process, more complex elements than iron can form. As the stellar debris from the explosion travels at near the speed of light, the Enterprise would have to fly at high impulse or warp one just to stay ahead of the most dangerous parts of the explosion. But the data gathered from this close encounter with the supernova would be invaluable. You almost understand that all that we are, everything that makes up your environment where you live, could not exist without the explosions of stars like Betelgeuse. Over millions of years, all that stellar matter coalesces into a new cloud of gas and matter. Perhaps a new solar nursery will form new stars, new planets, and new life forms. Unlike all the silly clickbait about the supernova, it's not something to be feared, but to be celebrated. We will undoubtedly receive an increase in gamma and neutrino radiation, but our atmosphere is more than capable of preventing anything of significant impact from this brief burst of radiation. What will happen is that some night your descendants, or perhaps even you yourself, will look up at the sky. And where the familiar Orion constellation is, there will be a star as bright as the full moon. Everyone will be looking up for a change, rather than absorbed within themselves. Over a period of weeks or even months, this bright beacon will fade, and a new small nebula will remain, slowly expanding. At the core of this cloud will be one of two things either a neutron star or a black hole. Betelgeuse is just massive enough so that the implosion may form a black hole where nothing, not even light, can escape its grasp within the event horizon. But scientists are not certain of this outcome. A neutron star, on the other hand, could be just as interesting. This super dense star would almost certainly be a pulsar, a kind of rotating lighthouse in space. In either case, scientists would study the aftermath of the Betelgeuse supernova for years. Why are we talking about this now? Well, first of all, in 2019, Betelgeuse went through a rather unusual and sharp dimming event. It eventually recovered a bit, but not quite to its former self. Dimming is normal for Betelgeuse over predictable cycles, but this event was unscheduled, so to speak. Was the event an incidental mystery, or...? Many scientists believe that this is evidence the star went into a new stage of fusion, probably a carbon stage, Giving the star something like, at least from our point of view, six centuries to several thousands of years of life left. However, another paper published in June considers the recent pulsations to be much more erratic than even that, and that the star could be entering the final stages of carbon fusion. This means that we could have decades left, but more than likely a few centuries to go. All they know for sure is that the star is becoming increasingly erratic, Logic suggests that it's going through the processes preceding a supernova. And if we had a starship like the Enterprise, we could certainly find out for sure. I know it's unlikely, but I do hope that I'm able to witness such an event within my lifetime. If I see the Betelgeuse supernova, I will salute it and thank it for all stars like it for helping to create the universe we know. 
I think Carl Sagan said it best. Some part of our being knows. This is where we came from. We long to return, and we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We are made of star stuff. We are the way for the cosmos to know itself. So, space friends, tell me in the comments what you will do when the Beetlejuice supernova flashes in the sky. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit that notification button because I do put a lot of still shots and shorts here lately on my channel. Also, if you want to support this work, in fact, you can get this very enterprise model at my Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash resurrected or become a member on the channel, and I thank you so much for those of you who are patrons. Currently, I don't have a lot of patrons compared to most channels of a similar size, but I do believe I will get there. Now, stay tuned for retakes. This is when the star becomes a supergiant. In this case, a retake. This is when the... retake. This is when the star expands into a giant. In this... retake. This is when the star... God. This is when the star becomes a giant. In this... Oh, oh.